Thank you very much for the invitation today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, elders past and present and emerging. I'd like to also uh, thank the organisers of the two-day symposium. I think it's really timely and very exciting. Today I'm going to talk through issues that Paul Harnett and I have been pondering for some time. And this, op this uh, talk today has given us an opportunity to step back and do a little bit of conceptual thinking and integration of, of some work that we've been doing for probably close on 20 years. So I'm going to start off not directly focusing on the use of methamphetamine or even the use of illicit or illicit substances. I'm going to step back a little further and start thinking about a conceptual problem that we have in the child protection field that I think affects each and every one of us who are working either directly on the front line, are working in family support, or are working at a policy level. So I'm going to talk through the problem about making decisions in the context of uncertainty. I'm going to make a suggestion about a potential solution. And then I'm going to show you some preliminary data, well, some published, recently published data, and then some preliminary data from some work that we've been doing in the UK that does not necessarily provide a solution, but I think opens up discussion. So, fortunately, it is early in the morning, and everybody's got their thinking hats on, because I'm going to draw on a model of signal detection theory that comes from psychophysics. The problem that we have in child protection is that often the decisions are not clear-cut and we're not really sure where we should be going but we need to make a decision and so when there is uncertainty you are likely to make mistakes whether you are looking for a radar blip a, a blip on your radar which is where the signal detection so physics model originates from, or whether you're working in child protection. And here is your problem of making mistakes. We could say, for example, that on this side of the room, there is a fire present. Some of you, and there's a faint smell, some of you will make a decision that yes, there is a fire present on the basis of that faint smell. And that's correct. And some of you will say, no, there isn't a fire present. And that is actually a miss. It's an incorrect decision. On the other side of the room, there's no fire. And some of you will say, is that, is that smoke? Isn't it smoke? For those of you who say, no, it's not smoke, it's a correct decision. For those of you who say it is, it's a false alarm. Your cross-sectional assessment at this point in time is prone to error because the signal is not strong enough. The only way that we're going to make sure that we don't have a false alarm or we don't have a miss is by increasing the strength of the signal. So how can we do that? Well, we could all leave the room, having made an assessment, and we could come back some months later to see whether, in fact, we were correct. But that is possibly not the best solution to the problem. And of course, you've all done the big conceptual leap because you can apply the same signal detection model to decision-making and child protection. Now, I'm not suggesting for one minute that 25% of our decisions are false alarms or misses. We actually have no idea what percentage of misses we make or false alarms because we actually have very little data that really tracks longitudinally decision-making at that particular level of nuance. So we have some data coming out of WA, which has been interesting looking at notifications recently and re-notifications and subsequent substantiations that suggest, in fact, that perhaps the error rate at that particular, in this particular point in time, is around misses. 
but we don't know. So, how do our fam what do our families look like? We have two distributions, if you like. We have a large number of families. We have those families where we could plot protective factors far outweigh risk factors at our initial cross-sectional assessment. We have a distribution of families where the risk factors clearly outweigh the protective factors. <coughs> That's, those extreme ends of the distribution are not actually problematic. Here lies our problem. The overlap of families where there are both risk and protective factors. And that's where our misses happen and that's where our false alarms happen. This is our error, point of error. So, what do we need to do? We need to strengthen the signal. Under conditions of uncertainty, and where decisions have to be made, practitioners draw on their own set of values, beliefs, experiences. And these, under conditions of uncertainty, are going to still introduce error rate because we all have our own set of biases, beliefs, values, heuristics that we use. This is a case that is similar to the case I had last year. Therefore, I'm going to make some assumptions about what the likely outcome is. <coughs> some of the work that's coming out of uh, 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 North America that was inspired by a wonderful person called Professor Len Dalglish, a Queenslander here, looks at the idea of there being a pra uh, family focus bias and a child protection bias. So some workers will be reluctant to remove children at all costs, will be very reluctant to the threshold for removing children it has to be much higher. Others will have a child protection bias, their threshold for removing children will be much lower. Some of the work that Fluke's been doing, really interestingly, suggests, at least in his small North American sample, that frontline workers tend to be child protection focused they're risk averse, and the managers in his study tended to be family preservation focused. Regardless of where you are, this will not improve decision making. It will simply shift the threshold. It will simply shift the kind of errors you're more likely to make while you're doing a cross-sectional assessment. So here we've got the decision threshold where we see a child protection focused decision maker who's making more correct decisions about removal but is making, uh, but is having false alarms. And here conversely. So the first bit of my talk is to persuade you that there is some merit in thinking more carefully about the kinds of errors we make in child protection and start thinking about the practitioner biases and the organizational, uh, organizational constraints that influence that decision making. For example, there's quite a well-established literature that when there's been a major child protection uh, review uh, uh, as a consequence of perhaps a child death in a particular local area, you will fit, see a shift in decision making to being more risk averse. And there's that because America is such a large place with so many people, you can actually do that kind of nuanced work in fairly densely populated areas. And it's quite a well established fact. So, organizational as well as individual practitioner characteristics will influence bias in decision making. So we have structured decision making with a, a, a very commendable evidence base. The problem with, and I, I, we would argue, Paul Arnott, and I would argue that structured decision making is a really important tool. 
However, structured decision making still tends to load on static risk factors. And whilst it is an extremely useful and, and important approach actuarial, in the actuarial risk assessment field uh, across the whole of uh, psychology really, what we're still seeing is a focus on initial assessment and a focus on static risk factors. So once you've scored high on neglect or high on abuse, where you have a look perhaps at an item level, you'll see things like previous children removed, psychiatric history, admissions for substance misuse. You actually can't lower your score. Now they are indeed, actuarially speaking, risk factors. So they're correct in that sense. But what they don't tell you is what's going to happen next. So, we're going to propose that what we need to do is think about a capacity to change model. So I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so talking in a little bit more detail about this model. So it was developed by Paul Harnett um, a number of years ago, and there are essentially six phases to this model. And I, I guess what I'd like to do, what, what I'd like you to do while I'm talking, is have a little bit of a think about your own reflective practice, because a lot of the time when we do training, we find people saying things like, actually, I kind of do that already. But then we say, how has this helped? And often people will say, you've made a process that we do implicitly more explicit. So I would be curious to know to what extent some of this resonates with, with people here who sort of say, actually, we kind of do that already. So the first step in your capacity to change model is assessment. And we all do assessment well. We do assessment extraordinarily well sometimes. It takes clinical psychology trainees in the clinic I work in three or four or five sessions to do a clinical assessment. We get large amounts of information about age of first use, root of use, etc., etc., etc. So we're quite good, in fact, we're extraordinarily good at getting history. What we're less good at is making is, is making judgments about quality of the parent-child relationship. And depending on the setting that you're in uh, and, and your own professional background, the extent to which you also make um, an assessment of the child's home environment. I think, I mean, child protection workers do that extremely well, other, other groups less so. All right, so you've got an enormous amount of information. How do you make sense? of this. And I'm going to come back and unpack this idea of case conceptualization in a few minutes. But we really need to move away from this huge bundle of assessments to saying, how does this inform a treatment plan or a support plan for this particular family? Where does this take me explicitly? So we need a model for developing case formulation or case conceptualization. We need to identify and define goals for change. And this is, if you like, the key bit of the capacity to change assessment. This is the dynamic bit. This is the bit where you sit down with the family and you work out very clear, objective, measurable goals. We don't say things to families like, you need to understand this child's developmental needs better. I don't know what that means. What I do understand is, your six-year-old needs to have breakfast Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday this week before he goes to kindy. How can we make that happen? So our goals, the whole process around identify, going from generic, important generic goals to zoom out, 
needs to be accompanied by a process where we are working with families to zoom in and really get buy-in for particular goals and for us to be really explicit so the families themselves can be engaged in the goal setting process and know what it is that they need to do. And there's no such thing as a goal that's too small. The little things really matter. <coughs> so how are you gonna support this family to make these changes? Well, you're going to need to have, we would argue, a time-limited evidence-based intervention, and I will come back and make some suggestions around a model that we've developed and used. And at that point, after that process, you are then in a position to actually start increasing your certainty about this family's capacity to change. This is not to necessarily mean that you should step out of family support or that you should discontinue engagement in the statutory system. In fact, it may be an indicator that you need to escalate. But it's going to reduce uncertainty because you've got some understanding of the dynamic factors that are influencing the family's capacity to change. And we're going, to, we're going to move on to this idea of unpacking step two. What do we mean by case conceptualization? Well, again, it's something that I think many practitioners in social care do implicitly. It's a kind of idea that's come from clinical psychology and psychiatry. And it's about taking all of that bundle of forms and all of that interviews and talking to the GP and the health visitor and a whole range of the kindy teacher and a whole range of other people and trying to pull together a meaningful understanding of what has influenced this particular child's outcome or influenced uh, or led to the current situation that the family's in. And there's two bits about, this, about case conceptualization. The first bit is about descriptive information and working out a way of classifying all of this information that we've got. And by and large, people are reasonably good at classifying descriptive information. But the really difficult bit of case conceptualization is actually around what's called inferential thinking. It's trying to work out what the chain of events have been and what are the current factors that are maintaining a particular problem. The reason that case conceptual <coughs> I think <coughs> excuse me, I think case conceptualization is particularly important in the work that we do is that it provides an opportunity to do an individualized, individually tailored support plan. So there are lots of par parenting programs out there that we can take off the shelf. But, tr but, and for some families, and you know, there's a wide array. And for some families, yeah. those, there will be particular parenting programs that will really strike the mark. For other families, they won't. We have currently no way of being clear about why we're choosing program X over program Y. And that's because we are not really fully engaging in a case conceptualization process. So you need an underlying theoretical model, you need an explicit procedure, and you need a way of generating hypotheses. Now, all of these kind of sound like mad, large, crazy words that perhaps don't necessarily, were not what you necessarily expect, expected coming along to a nice symposium, but bear with me, <laughs> bear with me. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a conceptual model. How do we start working out where to even start in some of the families that we're working with? The first thing that I'm going to propose is that we need a way of organising the huge amounts of information that we have that gives us a way of thinking about this in a more orderly manner and in a way that's less chaotic, both for the practitioner and for the family. Now, families that we work with are really overwhelmed. Now, they feel their lives are messy. You know, their lives are messy. And often, as a practitioner, you can walk away and go, oh, that's a mess. Oh, 
where are we going to start? So, the model. Let's put the children centre stage. First thing in this model that we're interested in is working out the child's developmental outcomes. Physical, cognitive, language, social, behavioural. What is this little kid really good at? Let's think about our little six-year-old. Yeah, he's a really good runner. He's actually got a best friend. He's really, really fidgety. And he comes to school a lot of the time without lunch. But he kind of um, speaks up and does show and tell really well. He's a good storyteller. He's got language skills. So we have a child here that has got some strengths and, and potentially areas of difficulty. How did this little six-year-old arrive at this place? What is it that we need to think about that, enab that enabled little Mr. Six to get to where he got to the way he did? The first thing we're interested in this particular model is the quality of the caregiving relationship. Who loves this little boy? Who is keeping this little boy safe? Who is demonstrating sensitivity to this little boy's cues and needs? Because a good quality caregiving relationship is the strongest proximal predictor of outcome for this little six-year-old, for young children, infants and young children. So we need a way of understanding and assessing the quality of the caregiving that this child is receiving from both a primary caregiver and other caregivers in his life. And we may in fact make some, form some views about the fact that there is in fact a very sensitive caregiver and that they are, uh, and that we can kind of start thinking Look, a lot of this little six-year-old's pro-social behaviour, uh, the, the fact that he's got a best friend, the fact that he's got good language skills, is because he spent a lot of time with a grown-up, with an adult, who loves him, who cares for him, who talks to him, who has shown him the way in the world. So who is that person? We need to identify that person or people. But there is... So the construct that we use to understand quality of caregiving is emotional availability. And I think it's a fantastic practice framework, actually, um, that gives you very clear uh, categories for sensitivity, structuring, intrusiveness, hostility, and importantly, allows you to also make some assessments about child responsiveness. So we're not just looking at a parent or a caregiver or a uh, caregiver's behaviour, we're also looking at how the child in turn responds. So if you were doing a home visit and the little six-year-old came, came back from school and walked in and the first thing they did was go up and show the sticker that they got for coming first in the running race to the person you were talking to and that person put their arms around them and said, well done love, let's put that on the fridge. You're getting an enormous amount of information just in that three or four sentences about child responsiveness and engagement and caregivers response to that. So the quality of the caregiving is so important to determining good child outcome and I, in my, my experience across a number of different jurisdictions is that sometimes it is missed out when we are looking at our concerns around um, child protection status, child protection involvement. We also need to understand something around parenting skills, routines and expectations. That little Mr. Six-year-old can't stand in line at the, can at the tuck shop and hit the little boy next to him and push him over. You know, he, there, there are certain behaviours that are just not acceptable and children need to learn some pro-social behaviour. They need to have some rules, they need to have some structure at home. Um, 
And I think really it's uh, very important to also understand parents' values and expe expectations around behaviour. So our blue circle is really important in this model. Let's, for the sake of argument, assume that his primary caregiver is his mum. We need to understand her state of mind. Mums who are depressed are not sensitive caregivers. Mums who are really anxious are not responsive to children's cues and who are really stressed. People with considerable dysregulated affect who are impulsive don't provide consistent routines in caregiving and are reactive. So, you know, little Mr. Six spills his Milo in the morning over his only clean school uniform. And mum's shouting, possibly even hitting, very punitive response to that particular incident because she's got very dysregulated affect. How come? How come? How do, how, why are so many of the people that we work with dysregulated, impulsive, and so prone to aggressive behaviour? Largely, I think, because many have a long history of trauma. So this is the first time I'm even going to mention amphetamines in my talk. So what of substance misuse? It plays in, of course, to parents' state of mind. And does different class of substance matter? It's hard to find data on this in the parenting literature, and it's not for lack of looking, I can assure you. Um, there's actually very little uh, there are very few studies, so anyone with a PhD topic, looking for a PhD topic, this is your topic. What does the quality of caregiving look like in families where there's uh, parental amphetamine use? Because all we know about is alcohol and opioids. So does particular substance matter? My own view is that it almost certainly does. There is no denying the fact that major sedatives, such as the opioids, um, are not going to increase the likelihood of aggression and hostility unless that person is in extreme withdrawal. Similarly for cannabis, which is not to say I'm condoning the use of either cannabis or opioids in parenting. What do we know about amphetamine? Unfortunately, we do know that there is a very robust relationship between the use of amphetamine and a range of aggressive and hostile behaviours. We know that there's an increase in paranoia, disordered thought processes and delusional thinking. And that we know at the extreme end of the scale, it tips into psychosis. And I'm very happy if anybody is particularly interested in looking at some of those uh, some of our ideas about underlying mechanisms to, uh, to send you any of these papers, actually. That's fine. But essentially what we do know is that impulsive people are more likely to use substances. Substances are more likely to make people impulsive, and amphetamine-type substances in particular, and all the psychomotor stimulants, but we don't have much cocaine, are going to do likewise. So we have a parent state of mind that, in fact, due to their use of substance, substances may significantly compromise their capacity to do what's the inner circle, sensitivity and structure and routines. Where is this mum and this little six-year-old located in terms of culture, community and family? To what extent does this engagement with those brown, with the brown circle, as we call it, provide an area to buffer some of the adversity or to provide a challenge? So again, let's think about, is this mum living in a drug-using area? Is she living in a block of flats? There's a whole lot of dealing going on. Is she living out in a remote community where she actually has good connection to culture and family? Or is she actually living somewhere where 
family is posing significant challenges. And we need to know about the wider environment that this mum and our little six-year-old are living in, including the quality of caregiving relationships with other adults, and of by proxy, what I'm really talking about here is potentially domestically violent um, relationships. We need to know about housing problems, financial problems, and strain. If we use our integrated theoretical framework, what we have effectively done, I won't even attempt to use this mouse actually, what we've, what we've effectively done is that we have used the literature and the theories from child development to, unfor to inform our understanding of this child's developmental outcome. We've used our literature from attachment theory to understand the quality of the caregiving relationship. We've used the extensive literature from behavioural parent training to have a sense of the extent to which there are uh, strategies in place for managements of behaviour. We're drawing from psychopathology, adult psychopathology, to understand the pink circle. We're drawing from social, uh, from sociology uh, and anthropology to understand the importance of connectedness to culture, family, and community. And we've placed it into a larger ecological context. So what you can do is take this vast amount of information that we get and actually classify it descriptively to try to come up with some understandings as to why our six-year-old is where he is. So for me, the question is not, is this mum using ice? For me, the question is, what is the evidence that this parent's use of methamphetamine for today's talk is impacting on their own well-being, the pink circle? In turn, what is the evidence that this parent's well-being is, is affecting their ability to provide a structured environment that meets the child's needs, our blue circle, a warm, nurturing and safe environment that provides the quality, caregiving environment, and how and what evidence do we have that the child's outcomes are compromised? I think this is, this is not for a minute to dismiss or to minimise the potential impact that a drug such as methamphetamine may have on family functioning. But I think we need to ask far more nuanced questions that allow us to do some inferential thinking around what this point of intervention may be. And importantly, what are the strengths? because I'm sure you have all had experiences where you've actually worked with, with parents with substance misuse problems who actually are really good mums and dads. In fact, our literature suggests that about anywhere between 30 to 40% of children, infants, being raised with a mother with an opioid problem have secure attachment. We're not talking disaster parents across the board. We're talking about parents who often have extremely good foundational relationships with their kids. But, you know, sometimes they're not there. And that makes for a very, very different scenario. Almost, for me, independent of whether there's methamphetamine use. So here's the final bit of my talk. Let me just check the time. Oh, 10. All right. We've got a little bit, we've got a little bit before morning tea. So step four of the capacity to change was to use an evidence-based intervention. And the program that Paul and I have been involved with and is currently disseminated uh, through training at Griffith University is called the Parents Under Pressure Program. It's PUP. Um, we developed PUP not because we particularly wanted to develop a new program that was very much far from our agenda 15, 18 years ago. It was because we were actually, Paul working in child protection and me working in adult substance misuse, finding the same families turning up in each of the services. 
and saying and finding ourselves wanting to do something constructive for the families but failing fairly dismally with some reasonably good um, established interventions. In fact, Paul will still tells the funny story of being one of the first people to ever do the incredible years in, uh, in London, in the UK. And he and Stephen Scott used to traipse around with, you remember those enormous televisions? <laughs> they used to traipse, traipse around community centres with these enormous televisions, trying to entice complex, high-risk families to come along to the Incredible Years group, which is run as a video-based. So look, fabulous programme, absolutely love Carolyn Webster Stratton's work. We couldn't make it work with the families that we were working with. We tried a whole range of different approaches um, back there in the 90s, early 2000s. And we finally came to a view that complex families need individualized programs that need to draw from both attachment and behavioral parent training and need to take account of the fact that you may well end up in the house on the day that the electricity is going to be cut off. So there we have another 18 years of work behind us. But I guess the essence for us, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about PUP today, but the essence for us is that parents need to believe that they can be the best parent for their little ones. That they are really key to their outcome, that their kids need them and their love, and they need to be able to provide an environment where those kids feel loved and safe. And much of the time, maybe even most of the time, as parents, we need to be able to manage our own emotions. And so we needed a program that was going to help parents who, through a whole range of different adversities, have got to a place where they're not managing their emotions.